It's my pleasure to welcome you here to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you and empower you with knowledge so you make better financial decisions in your life. One decision I hope you've made, I mentioned it briefly yesterday, subscribe to our YouTube channel because our library of content is growing and growing and growing. We now have over 2,000 videos on our YouTube channel and the number of people coming in, subscribing every day, growing and growing and growing because you want more ideas, more ways to save more and spend less and don't let anyone ever rip you off. And speaking of ripoffs, gosh, it's hard to do good research in travel. A lot, a lot of con artists out there. And I got a tip for you to watch out for something when you're doing research in the travel field online. Also in today's episode, I want to talk about people working in side contracts, side jobs, gig work, whatever. I want to tell you how this is actually changing the economy in a very unexpected but very good way. So, oh, on good news, for you, not for airline stockholders, uh, airline demand, travel demand is falling right now. Fall, normally it does. And, you know, they say at fall, fares fall. And that is true again this year, but they're falling more than normal and fares are looking a lot lower than they were at this time a year ago. As an example, Southwest is having a sale that ends later this week that covers travel except during key holiday periods till the end of February. And a lot of the fares are crazy cheap on this new Southwest sale. And a number of other airlines, Hawaiian, Alaska, JetBlue, have been doing various versions of sales for the off-peak season which is generally now, outside of holidays, till the end of February is a time that there are usually good bargains. This year, they're going to be unusually good bargains. American United Delta have stayed on the sidelines so far in offering these better deals. So you have to look particularly at the mid-price airlines to find the better deals available in the marketplace. Again, Alaska, Hawaiian, Southwest, and JetBlue have been the four mid-price airlines that have been offering the most aggressive pricing for these next many months. Now, if you do book a trip, I need to tell you there are so many phony balonies out there who are giving fake Travel advice, fake travel advice. Imagine this, because now it's so easy using various uh, computing abilities like the much-hyped artificial intelligence to write fake travel guides that steer you in advertorial content to people who've paid for placement. And this has become a huge problem in the travel business is you're going to a place for the first time, let's say, and you're trying to figure out where you should go, what you should see, where you should eat, where you should stay, blah, 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 all the things were going to that place. And so you go online, you go to Google or whatever search engine, and you're looking for information on that place. And you go and you see something, gosh, this is so wonderful. This is a great guide. Look at all this wonderful information they're giving about the history of the place and all that. And then you start getting to recommendations. And you don't realize they're all fake. They're all bought and paid for. And so I don't know that this would necessarily be something you'd call a scam, but the New York Times in a profile found that Amazon is being deluged with fake guidebooks 
So if you go to Amazon when you're planning a trip and you go there to find a guidebook for where you're going, believe it or not, overwhelmingly, the guidebooks are fake. One of the examples that the New York Times gave, Rick Steves, who has been such an extraordinary benefit to people taking trips to Europe with incredibly well-researched guidebooks, there are now fake Steve's ones, like there's one called Mike Steve's, and people forget, oh, Steve's, yeah, that's the guy, and they end up with the fake guidebook. And so this is a serious problem in the world of travel, that you need to be on your guard. I can't give you yet, and I've been looking for a clear way to give you clear guidance on how you would avoid the scammers as you do a Google search or whatever, or you look on Amazon at one you're looking at buying. But just know that this is a big problem with the fake guidebooks. And when something is giving you uh, these just extreme recommendations, like this is the greatest restaurant I've ever been to in my life, you got to go there. I mean, come on. That's a tip-off. And so, Krista, yes. world of travel is one that people just love, mm -hmm. but it's so confusing always, it is. isn't it? It is. And when you have someone who has a brand name like that, like somebody could make a website that's like Mark Howard. Don't listen to that financial advice. Unless there's a real Mark Howard who's a fiduciary out there <laughs> that I just insulted. Yeah, it's scary because it can look really legit. So... All right, let's go to some questions related to travel. Uh, Rick in Maryland says, what websites do you use to stay on top of travel deals? So far and away, my favorite for finding airfares is going. Uh, used to be called Scotch Cheap Flights. Well, I'll say that like forever. You've finally gotten over the name change. I have not gotten You're over the name better. change. I have <laughs> not gotten over the name change. Scott, it's your thing. Anyway, going... <laughs> is fantastic if you love to start your trip planning by following wherever the deal is. I mean, that's my whole thing. I look for the deal, then figure out why I'm going there. And going, and there's some smaller competitors as well, but that's my favorite, gives you the latest hot deals and typically in coach, although they have a separate, more expensive product that gives you deals in premium economy and business class. These deals are all geared for travel outside the United States. I also like kayak.com slash explore. With kayak.com slash explore, you can put in your home city or other cities that you would consider departing from. And whether it's for travel in the United States or to Canada, or to Asia, or to Europe, or to South America, or Africa, whatever. You can pull up a map and go by month, or just leave it wide open. It'll show you the cheapest fares that Kayak has found to that part of the world, to each different place, and who it's on, and when that travel is. If you follow my rule, which is you buy the deal, and then you figure out why you want to go there. Um, what other sites do I love? Adore Priceline. Oh, do I love Priceline? I should marry it. Anyway, I love their hotel search engine, but it doesn't mean I always book my hotels with Priceline, but it's a stop I always make looking for hotel deals. Cruises, I'm not going to name a specific source for cruises. I'm asked often what I use for cruises. I use Costco Travel. Um, no service involved, it's self-service, but Costco rebates most of the commission back to you from the cruise. And so for people that are experienced going on cruises, using a high volume discounter, great. For people that are not experienced, using a cruise specialist, either at a traditional travel agency or at a cruise only agency that's all about deals, is where you should be. But first time cruiser through fifth time, maybe fourth time cruiser, you should not 
just buy a deal. You want that expert who can guide you on the right ship, the right cabin, the right itinerary, and the right time to do that cruise. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that ClarkDeals.com does have a weekly, um, I think it's usually weekly travel newsletter with deals we find, and we do post some travel deals on there as well. Steve in Missouri says, my wife and I are celebrating a milestone anniversary next year and are wanting to spend a week in Kauai to celebrate. and to Wild take a, Chicken Island. <laughs> and to take a you, break. Did you feel it was Wild Chicken Island when you were there with your daughter? I did see a lot of wild chickens. I loved it. It's such a wonderful place. So they want to spend a week there to celebrate and take a break from our two lovely but demanding toddlers. We are trying to be as budget friendly as possible. We have saved enough Southwest points to fly round trip for free and enough Chase credit card points to book a fancy schmancy hotel for eight nights for free. But what do we do about food? The oh, hotel does not hotel. have a yeah. The hotel does not have a kitchenette and no free continental breakfast. As the well seasoned Hawaii traveler you are, do you have any advice for dining on a budget? And P.S. My lovely wife refuses to eat Costco hot dogs for eight days straight. <laughs> wow. You wow. probably would suggest that What too. is wrong with your yeah. wife that she won't eat the dollar fifty hot dog and drink combo eight straight days? So. The key to saving money at, on food in Hawaii is what you've already said you can't do, and that is you're not staying in a hotel that has a kitchenette or staying in a condo with a kitchen because that's where all the savings are in Hawaii, and that's why there's on so many of the islands near the airport, there will be a, a Costco, there will be a Walmart. People buy their food take it with them from the airport to wherever they're staying, and then they have at least two meals a day that they can eat in their, in their property and save the enormous cost of food. So what I can suggest as an alternative on Kauai, the island's small, uh, is you can, uh, you can go to a supermarket and pick up things for lunch, as an example, or for breakfast, is one of the good ways to save money, maybe eat dinner out, but you you prepare your own meals, just like people have done in Europe forever where restaurant prices are high, is they'll go to a supermarket and get food and make some kind of thing that you can make, uh, make meals right there, or even buy uh, so many supermarkets now specialize in meals they prepared, but at much lower prices then you can get them at a restaurant. And when I was there last year with my daughter and her friends on spring break. Was that just last year that you were in Hawaii? Uh -huh. oh. I think so. I th maybe it was two years ago. <laughs> anyway, what I found on Kauai was that there are these great, they almost look like food trucks where the, with outdoor seating there because the weather's always so nice. And we would go for like a brunch and have, you know, like a coffee drink and like a, a, a decent meal. And it was less expensive and it was so enjoyable and the food was great because, you know, you are on this big anniversary trip. So maybe just choose a night to splurge, right? Did you go with your daughter and her friends to that beach I love at the complete western end of the island? We did not go. In fact, while we were there, somebody drowned at that beach. So. Did they really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's one of the most beautiful beaches in the world. I didn't hear about that. If you do go to that beach, though, be very careful driving to it. People get stuck in the sand going to the parking lot. Um, and it is like picture perfect being in that beach. And what a Debbie Downer you are I'm saying sorry. someone drowned there. I'm sorry. It was terrible. He got okay. swept away by a giant wave. He was like standing taking a picture. Really? Yeah. Okay. Ed in Florida says, will there be any one-way car rental specials from the Northeast to Florida this fall? If there aren't, I will be shocked. Those come up usually uh, in November up to maybe December 15th. And the way these work, if you're not familiar, the car rental demand in Florida from uh, December to April is massive. So... The car rental companies have done so every year except, I guess, 2020. What they do is they give you a car rental for like nothing. Uh, it can be $9 a day, $12 a day, $15 a day for typically up to 7 or 14 days. And the deal is you are their transport service. 
you leave from a city typically in the northeast, you drive the vehicle to Florida, you do your vacation there, and then you fly home, and you've had your transportation one direction, and you've had the vehicle you use while you're there. And then they reverse that each year, typically in April, for people who do the opposite. You fly to Florida, get your car, drive it for that period of time, take it back north, and turn it in. Now, I love the Clarkies and the Clark audience, and I don't like to play favorites, but this might be my favorite question we've had in a while. From Chris in Louisiana, I understand why you don't check bags, but what do you do for clean underwear and socks when you travel? All right, this is a wonderful question, Chris. Socks and underwear take up almost no room at all. So I take the number of days I'm traveling, and I put in a, a pair of underwear and a pair of socks for every day of the trip plus three extras. And so I never really have a problem with that. Now, if I'm on a trip longer than 14 days, because 14 is what I can do in a carry-on without much sweat, if I go past 14, then I do laundry. Rather that than and have my bag with me all the time. I always bring an extra pair of shoes when I'm traveling, so I stuff those things into my shoes. That's my trick. So when do I take extra shoes and when don't I? If I'm going to a place where the, there's a possibility, heavy chance of showers or snow, then I take an extra pair of shoes. Otherwise, I just take one pair of kicks, one pair of tennis shoes, running shoes, whatever, and that's all I take for the time I'm gone. So uh, the carry-on thing is becoming bigger and bigger because the number of bags the airlines are losing, unreal. And I don't know if you've seen the video that's been flying all over social media about the person who flew Delta and their bag got destroyed and all their items were gone. And when they got to the carousel, all there was was their destroyed suitcase. Oh, my goodness. I mean, the problems with checking a bag are insane, just terrible. And if you do feel like there's no way you can take a trip without checking a bag, then as I've said repeatedly over the last year and a half, please put in um, an Apple AirTag or the equivalent type of device to track your bags. The airlines hate it that you know where the bag is when they don't, but you got to protect yourself. Coming up ahead, gosh, there's such a wonderful thing that's happened with the economy, with people doing their own thing in different ways. I want to tell you why it's so good for the United States moving forward. I've shared with you some of the troublesome signs with how families and individuals are strained financially. I've talked about the rise in the delinquency on car loans, the rise in credit card debt, uh, the interest rates on credit card debt. And there's some things that are, in fact, upsetting, concerning. But at the same time, other things aren't happening. Normally, there's an if-then. You start having these rises in delinquencies and rise in uh, debt and things like that. And at the same time, we're not having a rise in the number of personal bankruptcies. In fact, they're way down from where they used to be. And I think the hidden factor is how many people are doing something on the side whether it's the thing we put under the general category of gig work or whether it's something that we're doing on our own that's so much easier now to do than it used to be. The idea of the virtual company, something that nobody's really tracking well. There may be some professor somewhere who's made that his or her specialty but it's not in the mainstream kind of reporting of economic data. But it's one of the pieces I'm having trouble putting together. Like, why is it that the number of businesses being formed 
has been so good lately, which ultimately is the seed for enormous economic growth. And yeah, there are going to be people who fail in the businesses they start, but a lot are going to be enormously successful. And the barriers to you starting your own business, so much smaller than they used to be, because you have all these forums and formats and places you can sell what you produce, whether it's a good or it's a service, the ability to reach customers. I'm asked repeatedly by people that are uh, entrepreneurs who are starting a business, and I'm asked, like, how do I publicize it? And I'm like, well, you're not going to go buy TV ads, but what are you going to do? Depending on what it is, if you have something that's a it's a unique kind of fun thing or a unique thing that the marketplace needs and you have a bubbly personality, you're all over social media spreading your message. Think about that. Marketing channels that are accessible whenever you want to use them and they're basically free. I mean, the, the change is unreal. So... I spent a long time in radio, decades. I still do some stuff on radio, but thats it's not a big part of what I do. And we do this podcast that you're either watching or listening to. And so we have this device here called a roadie. Road or roadie? Which is it, Chris? It's called a roadcaster. Yeah, road. Right. Rode is the brand, R-O-D-E, and it's called a Rodecaster. Yeah. Thank you. So this device in one box that their uh, most popular version is four or $500 mm-hmm. replaces equipment that radio stations not that many years ago were still paying 10000 to $50,000 oh, yeah. for. Definitely. And Minimum. Uh, Now you buy this thing, you can put it in a briefcase, you can travel with it, which I've seen when I've been at various financial uh, meetings, conventions, and you'll see podcasters who specialize in the financial area, they'll be there with their roadcaster. And they're setting up and you need the roadcaster, you need electricity or battery, Mm -hmm. uh, some kind of internet connection, microphones in a little case, you set up, bam. Yeah. You're going. And so, so many businesses and opportunities are like that now, where uh, you need to do payroll for a small business. There are these payroll services now that are for micro businesses with one to 20 people. And that's their specialty. And they make it really easy. And you set up, boom. They do your filings with the state, the feds, all that stuff. They make sure your withdrawal, your um, deductions are done right and all that. I mean, it has become the sweetest era to be an entrepreneur we have ever had in the United States. And so a lot of it starts with somebody doing something on the side, uh, posting things that they do that is something they enjoy on Pinterest and selling on Pinterest or or whatever it is, or selling on eBay, or selling through Amazon's Marketplace, or Walmart Plus, or whatever it is. The idea is today is an era of opportunity. Think of the brilliance of the food truck. I mean, I love that that created an opportunity for someone who couldn't come up with $3 million to open a restaurant and build it out, and they have a food truck that is the incubator for them then having their own restaurant. Why am I going on and on about this? Because it is so much easier than it used to be for you to be you. You're working for the bureaucracy at some corporate entity, and you're feeling mind-numbed by that. There's a woman I know in Tennessee who worked for one of the big regional banks. And she was going brain dead. It wasn't her thing, but it was what she thought her lot in life was. But what she really loved at the end of the day was she went home to her dogs. 
So she, at her husband's encouragement, set up her own dog farm. I mean, like, not, not like some kind of brutal breeder that would end up on one of the TV newscasts, but a woman who's incredible at it. And her ability with social media to market these uh, puppies around the United States and Canada, unreal. And she's having the time of her life and now making more money than she made working for the mind-numbing bank. Sorry, if you're a banker, oh, mind-numbing. But anyway. For her, it was mind-numbing. To her, it was mind-numbing. So the whole theme of this is there, if there's something you love doing different than how you've been earning your paycheck, dip your toes in it and then see, is this your new you? Is this your new opportunity? Is this your chance to fill a want or a need in the marketplace and earn a good living for you? Because the opportunities there and America succeeds from the success that you and other entrepreneurs have. Okay, we'll go to questions now. This one's from Leslie in Arizona. I'm interested in ways to save money on gas. And she wants to know if you've heard of one of these fuel saving products. There's so many of them that I won't name this one. Yeah. Okay. Every time gas prices move up like they are right now because of the, the, um, the complicity of the Saudis and the Russians conspiring to push up the price of oil and in turn a gallon of gas around the world as they manipulate the marketplace, we're seeing higher prices on gasoline again because it's a worldwide market even though we're the world's largest producer of energy. So every time prices spike, these phony baloney devices pop up. Now, I'm especially not going to mention the one that you are questioning, Leslie, because they are an organization I talked about before, and I don't want anybody to, to, I don't want to name it, and then people think, oh, is that the good one Clark talked about? Listen to what they've done. They have bought advertorial space in legitimate publications, and they publish these articles as if they're news stories. Did you know they were doing this? Oh, yeah. I've seen it. So they're, they're publishing them as news stories. And then if you go Google them or whatever search engine, they pop up with all these glowing reports from these various newspapers and news sources that are all just bought and paid for. These devices that plug into the, um, what's the thing called under the dash? The, oh, whatever that thing is that all these devices plug into. Can't help and you. Sorry. I don't know. I can't believe I, I have a brain freeze right now. But anyway, the, there's the thing that if you go to a, a dealership and they're running codes on your vehicle to see what things are misbehaving, or you can go to an auto parts store and buy them, these various supposed gas savers plug in there and will give you, according to the promoters, these massive improvements in fuel economy, it's a bunch of horse hockey. Sure. Hooey. Hooey. That's a clean way to say it, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. What a bunch of hooey. Because we're a family-oriented podcast. And we keep getting questions about the um, ads that people see on Facebook for the supposedly Elon, Elon Musk invented electrical device that you talked about recently that is also not really invented by him. Uh, Diane and, it doesn't save you money. Right. Diane in Georgia says, my landlord informed me that I'm required to subscribe to a particular <sighs> internet service that the complex uses. What are my rights pertaining to this? Diane, the answer to this question has changed to for the good. Mm-hmm. All right. So what's happened is the landlords trying to squeeze every penny out of you are doing all kinds of deals They used to do them with private cable TV providers and now internet service providers and all different kinds of things where they've already squeezed you so much for the rent and then they force you to pay them all this other money. Well, there's a way to bypass their rip-off mandatory internet service because it's only mandatory if you sign up for it. It's the only one you're allowed to use. It's a wired internet 
into the apartment building or complex. But now, from Verizon and much of America and T-Mobile and much of America, you can buy what's known as fixed wireless, home internet service, that depending on what deal is available to you and who you have your cell phone service from, you can get their wireless home internet that will get around this monopoly garbage stuff from your apartment owner. And you, depending on where you live, you'll pay $30, $50, or $70 a month, most often $50 a month for unlimited internet that is fast enough to stream, not fast enough to game. So regular web surfing and video consumption work just fine with the Verizon wireless home internet, unlimited data, or the T-Mobile unlimited home internet. And Carol in Michigan says, I know that Clark recommends using a Chromebook for finances. And when Clark travels, does he pack his Chromebook and the laptop that he uses for surfing the web, email, et cetera? I like the idea of using a Chromebook, but not. I'm not certain that I like the idea of toting two devices around while traveling. Any suggestions? So actually, I don't use anything other than a Chromebook in my own life. And so I have a Chromebook that is at home that I use for finance stuff. And then I travel with a very small Chromebook that is the same size. Krista here has a big, is this a Samsung yep, or an Samsung tablet? Like the size of this. But with a, uh, for those of you who watch the video version of the podcast, a big tablet that comes with a built-in keyboard that attaches to it, and it's a Chromebook, and that's what I travel with everywhere. And so I only carry the one tiny version. It's small enough that I'm able to keep it out on an airplane flight when they tell you you have to put the big laptops away. So it's just great for me when I do travel. And so that's what I use as my travel machine. And then I have the Chromebook I use for bill paying. Now, as we've heard from a number of people that are very smart in the computer field, they've said that if you use a Chromebook, what I've heard repeatedly, that it doesn't have to be any specific Chromebook specifically for bill paying, that the Chromebook format is so secure that you're fine using just the Chromebook anywhere you are. It doesn't have to be a dedicated Chromebook. But well, you would want one that doesn't download software and stuff, right? You want one right. that does not do that because some do. Yeah. So if you are downloading software on a Chromebook, which generally, which I've never done, mm -hmm. um, then you're creating the same possibility of prying eyes that you have with a MacBook or a Windows computer. And for those of you watching the uh, video version of our podcast, you may see that I have a non-Chromebook here. I have an LG Graham Windows computer that we have to have for certain functions with the podcast that we cannot use the Chromebook for. You were very unhappy when I made you switch. Oh, from your man, Chromebook. it's so hard for me because Windows computers are like by a factor of like 20 more difficult to use than a Chromebook. Sorry. So, you know, you don't, you're sorry, not sorry. You don't seem sorry <laughs> at really all sorry. about no, that. So that's okay. <laughs> um, there was a very negative story about Chromebooks recently, and I don't remember where it was, about how Google has harmed itself and harmed customers by not supporting the Chromebooks for a long enough period of time. And a huge number of Chromebooks that school systems have bought have been obsolete way before there was any problem with them because they weren't software supported by Google further into the future. And that's an area that Apple has been fantastic with, with the MacBooks, that they support them for such a long, long period of time, which is uh, clever like a fox. Is that what it's called? Smart like a fox? Whatever that expression is. What is that expression? I think it's Smart clever like a, like a fox. Whatever it is. Anyway, I always mess up those phrases. 
the MacBook thing is just so brilliant because it maintains value and uh, is a support under the used MacBook market. And Google needs to learn this from Apple and provide better ongoing support for security for Chromebooks than historically has been the Google thing to do. I want to thank you so much for listening today. Again, bookend. Remember, what are we about? You learning ways to save more, spend less, and avoid getting ripped off.